My name is Mike. We're here at uh, Lewis and Clark Public Library, and we're trying to get as many people as we can to tell us their CPS horror story. So I guess I'm going to kick it off here. I don't have. I don't think my my horror story is nothing compared to most people, but I'll tell you just a little bit about about me, just because I want people to understand that CPS is going to CPS doesn't care anything about you. They don't care anything about your history they don't care whether you are uh, they don't care anything about your socioeconomic status they don't care about anything about you I'm a registered nurse I've been an RN for almost 22 years I've, I owned a business here in town for seven years I was a uh, community and home-based services provider for the Veterans Administration through my business I've served in three branches of the military uh, I have a bachelor's degree in nursing um, the only reason I say any of that is just because I want you to know that it doesn't matter who you are. If CPS decides that you're the you're the target and you're the you're the losing parent, you're going to lose. CPS, at least in my case, colluded with the guardian ad litem, and the guardian ad litem herself used to work for Child and Family Services. She was a regional administrator, so there's a lot of collusion going on, and we're, we're doing our best to uh, work with the legislators and various other organizations to just try and organize, I guess, some sort of a grassroots movement and gain a little bit of momentum. We have to put, we've got to start putting numbers together to get uh, CPS to take notice that it's not it's not going to be divide and conquer anymore. They're not going to take us out one by one. We're going to all get together. We're going to band together, and we're going to form uh, some sort of a some sort of a movement and uh, take take advantage of the legislation that we helped get through. And um, quite honestly, um, at least in my case, I, I have four children. One of them is an adult. But I've never had any issues with my kids whatsoever. I have terrific relationships with my children. And they, once my wife decided she wanted a divorce, I lost all my kids. Currently, I can't see, I'm not supposed to see any of my children. And I've done absolutely nothing to deserve that. My kids still want to see me. I live within, I can walk to my, I can walk to my, my house where my kids live. And, less than 10 minutes. My kids know where I live and they, they literally can't see me and I can't see them. So uh, for me it's a terrible situation but uh, in comparison to a lot of other people's stories mine, mine is pretty minor but suffice it to say Child Protective Services is not, they're not trying to protect families, they're not trying to reunify families. I think they're in the business of Destroying families. Picking and choosing winners and losers, and it's all about power and control. They don't care anything about what's best for the kids. I honestly don't know what it is. It's, it seems pretty satanic and sinister, if you ask me. It doesn't. It's it's not random. It's not an accident. That uh, I've talked to social workers who have seen what he described as meth addicts. That they, no matter what they do, they CPS will not take their kids from them, and they probably. They probably should at least take them at least temporarily. And then you got somebody like me who's a, I'm a professional nurse. I have to pass a background check every time I get a job. I've passed dozens and dozens of background checks in my entire life. But supposedly I'm some sort of a danger to my own children. And it's it's pretty ridiculous. So I don't, I mean, I could talk for a long time on my issue, but honestly, I'm, I think I'd rather let some other people talk. But um, we need we need to fix this. And I'm not going to stop. I, I did this event all on my own. I spent my own money. I spent about two thousand dollars making an office and buying a whole bunch of messaging boards. And I, I have nothing better to do. I don't have I don't have a family anymore. So this is what I do now. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass pass the baton on to somebody else. So. All right. You guys want up? No. Come on. You can tell your your kid your family. They've also done it to her too. I know, but you know what I mean. Just, I don't know. Go ahead. Just say hi. I am so in my story. 
Hi, I'm Caribia. Um, um, so your name and boy. Basically, she's fighting for her children. They have put her through hell, and what she's been through is uncalled for. They've told me that I am not fit to be a mom because I saw animal cuts on my arms the first time with my daughter. And they told me that I am not allowed to live with my mom if I am allowed to get my kids back. And they told me this, that me living with my mom is unstable and if I continue, they're gonna get my mom involved and CPS is gonna ruin her life even worse. Um, with my son, they took him out of the hospital, the, away from me from the hospital the day he was born and he was 11 weeks early. Um, <clears throat> they said that I am not fit to be his mom because I held him wrong when I have photos of me holding my son the way the doctors told me and the doctor was even the one who took the pictures. They said that I am pulling stuff out of his arms and his hands to keep him alive and I'm not. I never did because it's the only way to keep him alive. Um, they said that I was playing music really loud when I have three other witnesses saying that I was in call with them with headphones in and how I could play music really loud I have no clue because I only had one phone on me at the time and I had Wi-Fi and the data which is the phone I have now um, and they took both kids out of the hospital the day they were born away from me Hi. This way. I hate cameras. I hate You'll cameras. live. Shush. Yeah, I'm doing it off camera. Okay, we're doing some off camera by choice for their own security reasons. I'll do the, I'll do it right here, focus on that so you can hear her on the side. So I'm Tiffany. I, uh, to get the volume there you go. I've had some massive issues with DFS in my past. I lost my kids due to some very unfair DFS workers. Um, this was over 10 years ago. I am currently the mother of the last person that was just seen on camera and I am trying to get my grandson from DFS. They are telling me that I am unstable when I have a very clear, I own my own home. I work full time as a CNA at the hospital. Um, the, their paperwork stated that I, my daughter was burned with cigarettes. And if you look at her arms, there's not a single solitary mark on her, no scars that were left by me. Um, they're just, they're, they're trying to throw in cases against me that were never even heard of in my life. Um, I thought about contacting the ombudsman from here in Montana and come to find out that one of the caseworkers that was working for DFS, um, I'll give first names only, Marcy is one of the heads of the ombudsman and will not listen to my case, my dad's case. Um, they have been bullying me for 12 years and I have had enough of them demeaning my life. I've had enough of them lying about me. And I have contacted an attorney in Missoula who is putting on a huge case against DFS. And the more families we can get, the more it looks better on us and that, not them. All right, you want to do your story then? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right, here's another one off camera for their own safety. That's one of the little boys that should be All right, I'm watching them. All right, go ahead. Um, so, so my case is, I'm sorry. Um, All right, just take your time. I moved back to Montana in August, and when I moved back, I had my three kids with me, and I went to live with my mom. Um, shortly about a month or two after I moved in with my mom, I was, <laughs> I moved back here because I was having trouble getting housing in, in from the state I was in prior. Um, and my mom offered for me to come here 
to help me get on my feet. When I moved in, they told me that I was, that it was not a safe environment for my kids, even though we had numerous um, welfare checks done by the police who cleared the house and stating that the kids were well fed, um, clean, house was clean, well clothed, everything. Everything was perfect. Um, but because we would not re allow CPS into the home because we did not feel safe, CPS uh, decided that we need it was unsafe environment. Sure, uh, about two months later, my mom. They told me that my mom's house was un, um, unsafe and that I needed to go to God's love. I followed them as long as I could, and because I did not want to go there because it's, there's a lot of drugs and criminals and rapists that go into that program, and I didn't feel safe and I didn't feel like it was a good place for my kids. So as soon as I got my check, I went into a hotel about a week later um, to give my kids a place safer than, than the place that they had required me to go to. Um, I was having issues with the place and so I waited that seven days to go to my mental health clinic to um, have them advocate for me. And when I got there, they, the, the, my caseworker stated that I needed to talk to my caseworker and to, and that I was, that they could not contact me even though they had my phone number, my email, and everything. They never reached out to me. They, um, the caseworker continued to state that, um, that God's love had, had gotten a hold, they had gotten hold of God's love and stated that God's love said that I would not be allowed to come back there and if I and that CPS stated to them to God's love that I if I did not go back to God's love that I would lose my kids so we contacted CPS CPS showed up at my mental health clinic um, Center of Mental Health and when we got to Center of Mental Health when I when we contacted them um, Lori Laura Laura McAuliffe um, got on the phone posing as Mary Fortune Blair, who was my caseworker at the time. Um, never identified herself or anything of that sort. And shortly into that conversation, I realized I was not talking to Mary Fortune Blair and I told her that I had to get off the phone and call my lawyer. She continued to state that if I got off the phone and I answered the questions of, was I on drugs? Did I, was I doing drugs? Where have I been? I lost my train of thought. Anyways, hi. You all know me. I'm Strassi, Strawberry Heart. And we are speaking up. We're not going to stop. We're going to grow. We're done dealing with this crap. My son was raped for 12 months in their care, or 15 months in their care from age 12 to 13. And it's horrendous, horrendous that, they, that they made force to lie to the judge that it was good. Give me a second. Who's that? What? Do you want pizza? No. I work there. Anyways, um, Ziva, I'm sure. Um, but anyways, we need to stand together. If you want to join us, put your name below. Here is the website to send your stories to. Anyways, there is the email to send your stories to. Screenshot it, and if you're in Montana, send them to this email address. <laughs> no. Do you have the number of attorney? I give that one too. Oh, yeah. hey, come on, hey. hey, go in. Okay. Hello there.
My name is Matt Furlong and I'm the president of the Montana Child Protection Alliance. And uh, our organization came into existence because there was a number of uh, community members that really felt uh, like the child protection system wasn't listening to them and wasn't supporting their needs and, and their children's needs. Um, so there's a, a uh, law that governs the Montana Child Protection System and our objective with our organization is to uh, advocate for the um, proper imp implementation of the law and uh, to make policies that are supportive to families and children. Um, one of the biggest concerns that we've had year after year is that we have a system built around punishment. The community, the state, fears the child protection system. And when I think of children needing help with their family or their family needing help with their children, I don't think we should have a system built on fear. I think people should be uh, thinking about child protection services at, as a support in the community that is somebody who comes to stand alongside and help find the right kind of resources. And um, if there's financial assistance, housing assistance, uh, energy assistance, those kind of things, we have services already for those things. And why wouldn't we be proactive in helping families uh, to find those those resources before we start looking at separation and like one of the individuals said there's there's people that have had challenges with uh, addictions and you know rightfully so uh, we should be coming alongside and supporting them and, and helping them along with recovery and oftentimes those individuals get better treatment of uh, visitations and um, opportunities for reunification than, than those who don't have any uh, charges against them, don't have uh, any solid information as to whether there was abuse or neglect other than most of the time it starts with an accusation and that accusation becomes a real concern and yet there isn't evidence to back it up in so many cases that we've seen that's that's behind the the scenes of things and uh, somehow we just want to try to try to support families better and instead of looking at what all went wrong let's start today let's start changing this um, system so that people get the support they need children aren't separated from their families PTSD depression and anxiety and children and families is reduced and um, we just you know thank the families brave enough to stand up and uh, ask that the state if any if anybody is in Montana to um, also you know speak up and advocate for reform and child and family protection signing off thank you so again if you want more information put a link below or unless questions or anything you want to know and uh if you are in montana and you want to get an attorney to help fight your case matt c-o-w-y his last name lowy sorry l-o-w-y my bad and the number is 406-926-6500